the most important election in the country this year, duh, uh, is obviously going to be Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney. Incumbent Democratic president and former Republican governor of Massachusetts squaring off for the top political job in the country and thereby for the political soul of the nation. What's the second most important election in the country this year, though? It happens in June. It is important in its own right. It's also important because it's the one that will probably establish each party's respective momentum for the whole summer, heading into the final stages of the presidential race. The second most important election of the year would be this one, the one to recall Wisconsin's Republican Governor Scott Walker. A million Wisconsinites signed their names to an effort to get Scott Walker out of office now for the way he stripped union rights in that state and generally upended Wisconsin's political way of life and got Wisconsin the worst job record in the country. Mitt Romney, Republican standard bearer for the presidency, calls Scott Walker a hero and a man of courage. Scott Walker's recall election is on June 5th. We've been in a busy season for recalls these days. Uh, Russell Pierce, head of the Arizona State Senate, he's the guy who rammed through Arizona's anti-immigration papers, please, law. This was Mr. Pierce testifying before Congress this week in a don't tread on me tie. Uh, but he wasn't there as an elected official, because even though he used to be the most powerful Republican in Arizona, Russell Pierce was recalled from office back in Arizona, back in November. In the great state of Maine, the new hardcore conservative Republican majority there took away the right to vote on the same day that you register. That's something that Mainers had enjoyed for decades without controversy, but the Republicans said voting needs to be harder in Maine. Mainers said poppycock to that, and they recalled that Republican make voting harder law uh, through a citizen's referendum back in November as well. In Ohio, the new hardcore conservative Republican majority in Ohio voted to strip union rights in that state, kind of like Wisconsin, but worse. The Ohio Republicans law never went into effect, though, because it was recalled by more than a 20-point margin in November. Republicans passed it in the legislature. Governor John Kasich signed it, but voters rejected it like an organ transplant from someone with the wrong blood type. The Ohio union stripping law never took effect. The great state of Michigan has the same kind of process for recalls. In Michigan, signatures from 5% of the number of people who voted in the last race for governor uh, is what it takes to get a law on the ballot for recall. And like Ohio, if you get a law on the ballot for recall, that effort stops the law in its tracks. The law is no longer enforced. The law can't be enforced anymore until after people get a chance to vote on it. And that's the way it works in Ohio. In Ohio, I think it's 6% of signatures. Uh, that's the way it works in Michigan with 5% of signatures. But in Michigan, on February 29th of this year, without any of the fanfare that we saw in Ohio or Wisconsin, frankly, uh, these Michiganders turned in signatures to recall a new law passed by the Republicans there. They caravaned to the state capitol in Lansing. They carted these boxes onto the board of state canvassers. And this week, they found out they got enough signatures. They had more than enough by about 40,000. The staff at the Board of State Canvassers said they'd gone through the petitions, they'd totaled up the real ones, they'd thrown out signatures that they could not verify. They advised the Board of Canvassers that there were enough signatures, more than enough, to put this Michigan law on hold and let the people decide with a vote. Or maybe not. Because even though the people gathered enough signatures, and even though the staff of the Board of State Canvassers said they had enough signatures, the petition drive to recall this Michigan law was rejected today because the font on the petition was too small. Seriously, font size. A group calling itself the Citizens for Fiscal Responsibility challenged the petitions in Michigan because they said the font size was too small. The two Democrats on the board voted to let the petitions go forward. The two Republicans voted no. Quote, board members Jeffrey Timmer and Norman Schinkel said the law regarding the petitions is clear and they must follow it to the letter. Now, as we've reported in the past, Jeffrey Timmer, one of these two Republicans, um, he's one of three partners in a Republican consulting firm that was involved in bringing the font size challenge to the petition today. So these challengers, these citizens for fiscal responsibility, they live inside this guy's Republican consulting firm. Their address and their phone number are the same as the address and the phone number for the consulting firm that's run by Jeffrey Timmer. Jeffrey Timmer, Republican strategist and Republican member of the Board of Canvassers. So think about this. He is ruling yes or no on a font size challenge brought by a group that is operating out of his own Republican consulting firm. 
We had been wondering whether Mr. Timmer would recuse himself from this decision because of the obvious conflict of interest or whether he would stay in the game as effectively both the pitcher and the umpire. Now we can tell you that he stayed in the game. He joined his fellow Republican uh, in an even partisan split. Democrats voting to put the Republicans' law up for repeal, and Republicans, including Jeff Timmer, saying, no, 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 the font size is too small. Doesn't matter how many signatures you turned in, the law stands. No recall. Here's how the decision was reported in the local press. This is uh, WXYZ in Lansing. Yeah, you see they're just walking right up to the board right there. This really disrupted the hearing. Now listen to this. The board will take a 10-minute recess. And that was it. They're like, look, we're going to take a recess on this. Yeah, we're going to take a little recess. Democracy, wait right here until we get back and decide on something else, okay? The law at stake here uh, is an important one. Uh, right now, 21 states are in total Republican control. The whole legislature and the governorship are Republican. And since the big Republican wins that made a lot of that possible in 2010, since that great red tide in the midterm elections in 2010, Republicans have been using their control over these states to pursue some pretty radical policy changes. They have turned state houses into a nonstop anti-abortion palooza, going after abortion rates at a, uh, abortion rights at a rate unprecedented sin, sin, since Roe versus Wade. More than 90 anti-abortion bills turned into law last year alone. The aforementioned Papers, Please Law, SB 1070, pioneered in Arizona, imitated in Alabama and in South Carolina and elsewhere. It is currently having its fate decided at the United States Supreme Court. They strip union rights in Ohio. Before the people took them back, they stripped union rights in Wisconsin, where it's quite likely to end Scott Walker's time in office before the scheduled close of his first term. But this law that we're talking about in Michigan, this one that the people are trying to overturn in Michigan, this Michigan law is, in my opinion, the single most radical thing done by any of the all red states since 2010. This law, it's described as, Ameri uh, as Michigan's emergency manager law. It gets rid of local democracy. It lets the state declare your town to be too broken, too financially broken, for you to be allowed voting rights anymore. You're not allowed to have elected representation anymore. Your right to vote for what happens in your town, your mayor, etc., effectively nullified by the state. Instead, Republican Governor Rick Snyder appoints a single so-called emergency manager who gets put in unilateral control of just about everything, emergency or not. We have seen this at its extreme in Benton Harbor, Michigan, where the emergency manager stripped all power from the elected mayor and commission. After being stripped of all their power, the elected commissioners uh, tried to test that out. That can't be right. We were elected. You can't strip us of our power. They decided to test that out by declaring a symbolic observation of Constitution Week in Benton Harbor. The emergency manager said, no, you can't do that. They overturned that vote. There is no commission. Forget Constitution Week. There is an overseer in charge with unilateral authority. We've also seen the law at work more quietly sometimes in places like Flint, Michigan and Pontiac. In the city of Flint last night, on the eve of today's hearing on whether the emergency manager law was going to get recalled, last night with the prospect of the emergency manager law being put on ice until the voters can have their say on it, last night with every emergency manager in the state facing having his unilateral authority cut off within a matter of hours, last night in Flint, the emergency manager there all of a sudden posted a dozen new unilateral orders, including several affecting union contracts of public workers. Flint's emergency manager says the decision to post all of those orders, including the ones that rewrote the union contracts, had nothing at all to do with today's hearing. He said he'd been working on those orders for a while now. It was just a coincidence, the timing. After we saw that story in Flint, we checked with the website for the city of Pontiac, uh, which also has an emergency manager, a guy who once joked about himself as the tyrant in Pontiac. And hey, the ha-ha so funny tyrant in Pontiac also posted a slew of brand new orders yesterday, five of them affecting 
union contracts, the contracts of union workers and retired employees. They were all dated the night before the hearing where everybody thought that that recall was going to be given the go ahead, where it looked like enough signatures were in. Enough signatures were in. It looked like the state was going to have to put on ice, freeze that law that gave the emergency manager the power to issue those orders to rewrite those contracts. We have asked Pontiac's emergency manager about the timing of those orders, whether the timing has anything to do with the hearing scheduled for today. If he answers, we will let you know. This week, we sent a couple of producers from this show to Michigan to try to learn more about Michigan's radical emergency manager law. Talking with local elected mayors about the law, we heard a couple of things over and over again. A, the emergency manager law is not democratic. Democratic small d. It is not democracy. And B, their towns and many, many other Detroit towns are facing being taken over too. This is not going to be a short list of towns affected. Here's uh, Kyle Stack, mayor of Trenton, Michigan. We don't always tell the state of Michigan what they need to do. And I think that cities can uh, have better jurisdiction over their own areas. They know what needs to be done. They know what, where we need to go with it. Probably all going to be in line for him, though, with the way that's going. Because I talked to a few of the mayors here, and we're all we all have money issues. We're probably all going to be in line for him uh, for takeover. If you drive out from Detroit, which this month turned its finances over to the state for supervision, uh, if you drive out from Detroit, you come to town after town after town under some form of emergency management, some form of state takeover, whether it's having an actual emergency manager or just a consent agreement with the state to do what the state says or else. And it's not just Michigan. The stage is set for the takeover of towns in some other states, too, under various forms of emergency manager laws in those states. The capital of Pennsylvania, for example, the city of Harrisburg, becoming Exhibit A outside of Michigan. But the question for Michigan and for other states that are looking at this as a potential model is not whether cities and towns are in good shape or bad shape. The question is whether we use democracy as the way we fix problems in this country or whether democracy it's, itself is a problem. Whether this pesky thing about people voting for people to represent them must be gotten rid of in order for us to do what we want to do. Whether that experiment in governance is over and we govern in a new way in America now. Joining us now is the Reverend David Bullock. He's pastor of the Greater St. Matthew Baptist Church in Highland Park, Michigan. Uh, he's the president of the Highland Park NAACP and he's the president of the Detroit chapter of the Rainbow Push Coalition. Reverend Bullock, thank you for being here. Rachel, thank you for having me on the show tonight. Um, that was a big mouthful of what I just said about that what's going amazing. on. That did, was amazing. Well, did I get, it's, in terms of the way this has unfolded in Michigan, is that, did I get anything, did I say anything that was contrary to your understanding of how this has gone? No, that was a great analysis. The only thing I would add to that is that we, we've seen Public Act 4 and emergency management rolled out in a way that is also racial. Hmm. Uh, Benton Harbor. African-American population is very high. Detroit, African-American population very high. Highland Park, Flint, Pontiac. These, these are cities with a high percentage of African-Americans and Democratic voters. And so uh, not only is it anti-democratic, but it seems to have a racial undertow in the way the legislation has been implemented that has lulled many of us to sleep. Uh, and, and so now on the back end of this, we're seeing that it's hitting African-Americans, it's hitting low-income communities, it's hitting high Democratic uh, party voting communities, it's, it's hitting labor. Uh, and, and this is not what democracy looks like. Obviously, in a lot of these towns that are facing these kinds of takeovers, facing having their local rights, local voting rights overruled, there are big financial problems. There's a lot of problems of a lot of different kinds in all of these cities. Do you think that the concern about the overall health of municipalities in Michigan is primary in people's minds? Or with the emergency manager law, are people worried about losing their rights? Why do you see is the, the balance between those two levels of concern? Obviously, both of them have a big impact on people's day-to-day -day -to -day lives. Look, this is a false dilemma. We don't need financial stability. We need economic recovery. Mm -hmm. If you want to help Detroit, Flint, Benton Harbor, Saginaw, if you want to help the cities in Michigan, let's deal with foreclosure. 90,000 foreclosures in the city of Detroit. That's 90,000 forced evictions in the last three years. Wow. And so if you look at 300,000 people leaving one city, you're seeing the tax base leave. So this this city is not in financial strain because of mismanagement, because people are incompetent. That is not the right analysis. So we have to deal with foreclosure. We've got to deal with insurance redlining. Uh, and so what the state should be doing is helping to uh, the federal government, county government and state government to reinvest in these cities 
Uh, we, Michigan is a manufacturing state, really, really a one industry state. And so as the automotive industry, we saw manufacturing melt down. We saw plants go from Michigan to Mexico. So that, that's trade policy. This is, this is not incompetence as that's in Detroit coming back, and Benton Harbor. that redound to economic recovery in Michigan? Well, it's coming back, but it's not coming back fast enough. The jobs are not, we, we lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs. If, if, if 50,000 or 100,000 come back, you still got a minus and you still have to deal with the 90,000 vacant lots of vacant homes right. in the city of Detroit, the insurance redlining, the foreclosure. And we've been saying this all along. Uh, first of all, we don't need financial stability. We need economic recovery. Two, there's no connection between throwing democracy out and fixing the financial crisis. This is bad public policy. Who, where, where did, who drew this play? I mean, I mean, what's really going on? In Egypt, it was Pharaoh. In the South, it was slave masters and overseers. And now in Michigan, it's emergency dictators. I mean, what kind of public policy says we continue to cut, cut, cut police, cut fire, cut city workers, and somehow we'll stabilize the city and people will want to move back into it? This is bad. Bad public policy at its best. Reverend David Bullock, the pastor in Highland Park, uh, president of that city's NAACP, president of the Detroit chapter of the Rainbow Push Coalition. I understand, sir, that uh, this decision today on the uh, on not putting the emergency manager law on the ballot is not the end of it, that there's likely to be litigation. This is likely to go into the courts. I have a feeling that we're going to be continuing to talk to you about this as it unfolds. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going we're going to litigate. We're going to agitate and we're going to demonstrate. And this is not the last that you will see of the fight for democracy in Michigan. We're not giving up. Reverend Bullock, thank you. Thank you, sir.